From the tea rooms of the early 1900s to modern day cafes, tea has been a powerful connector for women to take time, come together and exchange ideas. Some historians suggest what transpired in many of the tea rooms of yesteryear laid the groundwork for the suffragette movement, allowing women to gather, exchange ideas, start businesses, and change their place in the world. So what better way to empower women today than by gathering inspiring entrepreneurs and leaders to share their stories over a simple pot of tea? Each week, our amazing women will be on hand to guide you on your journey. So if you're ready to be inspired, come inside and grab a cup. It's time for tea. The cosmetics industry is a multi-billion dollar marketplace. So what does it take to rise to the top and stay there? Joining me today are three leading ladies of the beauty industry. Jane Wurwan, co-founder and chief visionary of Dermalogica. Brenda Wu, the U.S. General Manager for SkinCeuticals, and Theo Kogan, founder of Armor Beauty. Thank you, ladies, all for being here today. And you all look so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, I want to know a little bit about you personally and how you started in the business. What drew you to beauty? Jane, let's begin with you. Dermalogica, this is your baby. You are an entrepreneur. So tell me a little bit about your background. I call Dermalogica my first child. I have two, I have two others who happen to be uh, daughters, but I emigrated here in 1983 with a suitcase in one hand and my beauty school diploma in the other to pursue the American dream. And uh, as an entrepreneur, there was a 10.4% unemployment rate in California when I got there. And that was a good opportunity because nobody was hiring, which forces you to look for what the opportunity is that you could do something yourself. So I believe that if you spot the greatest pain in an industry, you just saw the greatest opportunity. And the greatest pain in the professional salon industry was a lack of training. And so we seized on that and we started a training program through what we called the International Dermal Institute. And we still train over 100,000 skin therapists a year around the world. And in 1986, we launched Dermalogica, the product line. And it really stemmed from my training as a skin therapist. I went straight to study skincare from high school. And that stemmed because my mother drummed into myself and my three sisters, get a vocational training, learn how to do something, and be able to provide for yourself and your family no matter what. And my mother knew firsthand she was widowed at the age of 38 with four girls to raise. And she was a nurse. So she fell back on that training, and that's what kept our family together. So my journey has been through vocational training, and I'm still a, an enormous advocate for this idea of a skill set that's transportable, literally in your hands. And, uh, and that really has been the hallmark of success for Dermalogica. I, I think it's because we make great products, but even more importantly, it's the women entrepreneurs that own the salons, that sell Dermalogica, and they use the product in their treatment rooms that's really made the brand such an enormous success. So you started out as a skin therapist. Yeah, still am. I've never done any business training, never went to college, uh, never desired to, and I've never taken any outside classes other than in my industry. So I can see kind of what needs to be done and what's missing. How do you go from skincare therapist to entrepreneur with the beginnings of it? How does that begin? I think that entrepreneurs are born. I think that it's really helpful if as an entrepreneurial personality, you can learn a little structure and some tools to grow your business. But I, I don't think somebody necessarily with a business background is then automatically an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is somebody who's a risk taker. It's somebody who's not afraid to go out on a limb and kind of free fall before they really know that parachute's gonna open. I was having this conversation last night with a, a young entrepreneur and she said, I'm just you know, nervous to take the leap because how do I know if it's going to work? And I said, well, that's the point, you don't. But you enjoy the free falling. When you jump out of a plane, you assume your parachute's gonna open, but you can't open it before you get out into the air because you, you'd be entangled in your parachute. You've actually got to jump into the air and free fall for a period of time before you then feel that 
hopefully very, very reassuring tug that now there is air under your parachute and you will make a safe landing. But it, do you have the ability to step out of a plane and free fall? And I think that's an entrepreneur. Well, someone who's willing to uh, open that parachute certainly is, is Theo. Theo, you, you are a head rocker. You were a rocker girl for the Luna Chicks. You were a model. I mean, tell me a little bit about your story and, and how you came to Armor Beauty. Well, that's something I talk about all the time. It's like that sort of you just you leap into the void and you'd have no idea what's going to happen, but you just have to do it. And I guess having started, a, I started a band with my friends in high school. That's how the Loon Chick started. We didn't play music. We taught ourselves. We figured it out. And th then suddenly we were touring in, in England. And, you know, it, so having come from that space, and I went to art school. So I was in LaGuardia High School for art. So we were at this art school band. After about 10 years of that, I was like, hmm, something next. What's next? I love makeup. I'm so irritated with everything on the market that I put on that's lip gloss. I have to layer it with 10 things when I'm going on stage and then it's all over my face and then my hair stuck to it. And <laughs> you know, it's that thing of like, what's lacking in this space? And also I want natural ingredients in it. I can't find any natural lip glosses that are not, you know, colors that are not, ex you know, like the earth. So that was sort of the, the need that I found, the, the lacking in the market and then you know, went to LA, went and visited labs, went and visited packaging places, and found a great lab to help me create Armor Beauty Lip Gloss, which has um, eight natural butters and oils, and you know, colors all the way from very sheer and lovely to black. And Brenda, I love your story. You have this real academic background, and you're really what we define as the intrapreneur. You're inside that corporate structure, but you really have that entrepreneurial spirit. So tell us a little bit about your background with SkinCeuticals. Sure. Um, yeah, I had graduated from business school, and I was working at Banana Republic as a merchant for several years. And L'Oreal had acquired Kiehl's uh, from the founding family in New York, and they were looking for people with retail expertise to help them roll out retail distribution, which is something that is relatively new, uh, but was definitely growing and a growing importance in the beauty industry. So I joined L'Oreal over 10 years ago and worked at Kiehl's, um, helping them with their retail expansion. And since I've been there, I feel like I've had four or five different jobs all within one company. I mean, really great brands, but that are run very independently and with a very results-oriented entrepreneurial spirit. So Lancome, Giorgio Armani Beauty, and then finally when the opportunity came about to head up SkinCeuticals, which had a tremendous and very entrepreneurial uh, dermatologist, Dr. Sheldon Pinnell, as its founder, a strong basis in scientific credentialing, the support of dermatologists and plastic surgeons, as well as consumers um, in the US and worldwide, I, I leaped at the opportunity and the opportunity to, to lead the team and to grow, the, grow, the, grow what our founder had, uh, had set up for us. Coming up after the break, we'll tackle the topic of women and beauty as seen through the eyes of these industry leaders. Stay tuned. You are all in the beauty industry. And of course, we want to take a look at women. How do you promote positive images of women in the beauty industry? Jane. At Domologica, we studiously avoid the word beauty. We're a skincare company. We see our focus on skin health and wellness. And the, the reason is the term beauty, as applied to an industry, I think it's regressive. I also don't think it really describes what it is that any of us truly do. I think the word beauty is very gender specific. It really doesn't apply. Men don't feel that that applies to them, but skincare certainly does. And also, I've worked so much with, with uh, clients with clinical acne, cystic acne. They find the word demeaning and they find it um, regressive. I have a 16-year-old daughter and a 21-year-old daughter, both of whom do not identify with that word. And when I actually asked my 16-year-old my what word she would use, if, if what's an aspirational word, she said, I want to be unique, I want to be significant, I want to be strong, I want to be fit, and I want to be fierce. And I think that there are so many more current 
interesting words that we could all, especially all of us in, in, in the industry, could start to use to describe the work and the intention of what we do that could really, I think, do a lot to revamp the entire industry. And Theo, your thoughts on that? I mean, you're, you're a tough, you're a tough <laughs> chick. I mean, how do you feel about beauty and, and, and the images that you put out there? Well, I mean, my company's called Armor Beauty, so it, it's sort of a yin and yang of itself because armor is strong, you know, armor deflects things. And then um, the idea of Armor Beauty is to, um, you know, arm yourself basically with beauty, um, which, you know, and I agree with what you're saying completely, and you are you sound like a great mom. <laughs> if your daughter is using those words, that's awesome. Um, to me, you know, having been a model and being on stage and wearing very sort of garish makeup, where it was sort of this mask, and so, Coming from that, and you know, I watched a lot of John Waters movie, very, very draggy. So mm -hmm. for me, it was sort of this, you know, caricature of what beauty is supposed to be or was supposed to be, mm -hmm. and sort of that thing. Mm -hmm. So I took that, and so the idea of armor beauty is, you know, arming yourself, and the images that we put out are, it's for every woman, it's for all races, it's for all ages, it's, you know, it's for everybody, and it feels good, and it lasts, and it's protective, and um, and also the idea of like, if you're having a bad day and you throw on a lipstick or a lip gloss, it, it might make you feel better, so you're arming yourself with some joy as well. And I love lipstick, I love makeup. Uh, Brenda, how do you feel about images of women and, and what you're supporting? Yeah, well at SkinCeuticals, I mean, our mission is to improve skin health. So our founding by Dr. Sheldon Pinnell, the original research was really meant to understand how to better combat skin cancers. And that's where our most popular products, our antioxidants, are really recommended by dermatologists in order to help prevent skin cancer. But as a side benefit, we have also found a lot of anti-aging benefits as well. When we speak to patients and we speak to physicians, it really comes down to self-confidence. Mm -hmm women having the self-confidence, and when they overcome their cystic acne, when they overcome their rosacea, when they overcome even hyperpigmentation or signs of aging, to be able to have that confidence, to be able to express their ideas, take the seat at the table, lead a meeting, stand up in front of a group, and that's really where we, we focus our energies. And I like to talk about leadership in your case. How, how did you keep moving up the ladder within your company? Um, well, I've been, I've been very fortunate. I've had uh, some fantastic opportunities, uh, a really growing and dynamic market, some great mentors within the L'Oreal organization. And I think ultimately, you know, I'm surrounded by some tremendous entrepreneurs, but L'Oreal really does have an entrepreneurial spirit and focus on results. And ultimately, when we drive results at, at L'Oreal, whether it's through market share, sales increases, or customer appreciation, I mean, that opens more and more doors. It's very much a meritocracy, and um, we, we continue to promote from within. And something that we were uh, discussing before, uh, an ad that recently uh, came up here in New York City, it was uh, for uh, a big department store, and it showed two best friends together going to a holiday party, and it suggested that the one friend should spike the other friend's drink uh, to have a better time at the holiday party. I heard about it, and it's regressive. It's, it's one of those moments where you say, what were they thinking? Because we all know from advertising and being in the media and working with the media that any ad that ends up advertising a major company has gone through multiple rounds, or should have, of the ad agency developing it, the marketing team approving it, creative looking at it, and everyone decided that that was a good ad to run. Crazy, Reg regrettable. Listen, we can all make a misstep, but that's a giant misread of a target audience, and I mean target audience non-gender specific. I mean, I don't think any one of us uh, in, in the room or in our companies would, would even believe that that was possible that an ad like that could run with all, with all kind of budget behind it. What did you think when you saw it? There? Yeah, I mean, thinking about the amount of people that, that had to look at that and that approved it, and then if it was something to create buzz or you know get them attention for something like that, that's really gross. I just yeah. think that's like terrible taste and, and a bad way to try to um, you know get in the media. 
And uh, your thoughts, Brenda? I mean, advertising, especially at that scale, is such an opportunity for companies to put out positive messages. And um, you know, shoppers, and especially you know, younger shoppers, that, that ads seem to be targeted towards are highly vulnerable. And I think it was definitely a miss, a missed opportunity to kind of take the conversation to a much more constructive. I think they will have level. no doubt lost customers as a result of that. I think it tarnishes an image which I would have thought up until now was, was a good one. We pay a lot of attention to that. I think the message that it sends our younger consumer, or any consumer really, um, is, is important. And you have an opportunity for brand identity. I'm a huge believer in taking the, the, the tack of being prepared to tick off 80% of the people to turn on 20%. I think that that was what creates a brand. But you shouldn't do it in such a way that you're insulting people. It should have a measure of irony or humor to it or just, you know, abject absurdity that people say, wow, you know, it makes that brand stand out. Who would have thought that we'd all be waiting for the, for the you know, car insurance ads to come on? But I find myself waiting for the <laughs> Geico ad because they're so crazy. It's possible to do it without insulting anybody. Coming up after the break, we'll take a look at how these successful businesswomen manage the elusive work-life balance. That's coming up next. What seems really important for a number of companies these days uh, is to have a cause that they can get behind, do some type of social good. Is that important for your companies? Oh, absolutely. Um, at L'Oreal and specifically at SkinCeuticals, it's very important for us to give back to the dermatological community as well as to our end and consumers. And for the last several years, we've partnered with the Melanoma Research Alliance, funding um, research as well as a young investigator who's working towards helping to find uh, cures for melanoma going forward. And we also sponsor uh, complimentary sunscreens to each of our physicians as well as our consumers throughout the summer season. Oh, that's a wonderful program. So you're funding the research of one individual who's going out there and really taking a look at this issue? Yes, and we've funded several different scientists over the years. Why is that important for the company? It's important for us, I mean, for a, for a number of reasons. Um, but, you know, one of the top concerns that our, our customers, our dermatologists, are seeing patients for um, is the prevention of skin cancer. And they are addressing skin cancer, and it's one of the most preventable cancers out there. And so the more that we can further advances in that area, the more we'll be giving back to our dermatological community. In addition, in terms of consumer awareness, skin cancer is still one of the most preventable um, cancers as well in terms of through the daily application of a, of a sunscreen. And so that's something we feel it's an important message to get out there at both levels. That's wonderful. And Theo, your company is also uh, doing its part. Yes, I had been wanting to do something for a long time, and I partnered with a friend who's a tattoo artist and artist named Virginia Elwood. Her mother died of cancer about, I don't know, 16 or so years ago. And um, so we created a lip gloss that we co-branded that was for Gilda's Club in New York City. Um, and Gilda's Club is awesome because it's um, a support center. So it's for people who are suffering, their friends, their family, their children. It's just amazing. So they can go talk about what they're going through. It was founded by Gene Wilder and other friends of Gilda Radner. And I'm such a fan of Gilda. Um, so we named it Gilda. It's hot pink for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So we launched it last month and we're selling it and it's beautiful and fun and um, hopefully we'll do a lot of good. And Jane, the fight organization, it's huge. It's growing. Tell us a little bit about that and, and Dermalogica's part in that. I think it's one of the hallmarks of a brand versus a commodity is that you have a personality. And as a personality and as a brand, you stand up for the things that you care about and that you speak up about them. And so FIGHT is our social impact um, piece of our company. It stands for financial independence through entrepreneurship. And we focus on funding women to start or grow their own business. And we've so far funded over 70,000 women in 57 countries. Uh, we also focus on uh, funding vocational training and scholarships. 
and uh, we work with a group called She's the First and we partner with them in identifying young women who will be the first to go through high school and onto college and, uh, and empowering them. And we work as thought leaders in speaking out at the Clinton Initiative, at the UN, on issues of women's economic empowerment. It's the game changer globally. When women are economically empowered and control their own money, they invest over 90% of it back into their own families and into their communities. It's the number one solution to a lot of the problems we face. And because our whole industry of salon owners, 98% are women, it's an industry that speaks to this entrepreneurial spirit of women better than any other. And so we feel it's very true to our brand. Identity. And as such, we've got an enormous footprint globally um, about the work that we do. So how does someone get involved with the program? Do you apply? You could go directly to www.joinfite.org and that's our social impact site and you can see there the stories of the thousands of women that we funded, how you can get involved, how you can take action <clears throat> and also the partners we're working with if you yourself are starting a business and want to apply for a loan. Wonderful. One other thing I'd like to uh, take a look at is work-life balance or lack of work-life <laughs> balance. Uh, there's a lot of discussion. People are working themselves to the bone 24 hours a day, and especially as women, uh, as mothers, sisters, wives. Uh, how do you make it work? Well, it's definitely not easy. <laughs> I think we can all, we can all <laughs> attest to that. Um, you know, I think I heard somewhere that work-life balance doesn't really exist at any one point in time, but if you can balance it out over the course of your course of your life, that that would be considered a success. Um, I think a lot of things all happen at, at one time. Um, for me, you know, working, uh, leading SkinCeuticals is, is a very demanding, demanding role. I also uh, have three young children under the age of six at home. I live here in New York, but I am fortunate um, on many fronts. I think, first of all, I... I have a husband who uh, is also uh, fully employed, but very, very supportive. We're very much a team. Um, in the same way the team at work is, is critical, I think the team you have at home um, is also equally, equally important. And so we support each other in our careers and in our family. Um, and I also think that while business has become 24-7, I think for all of us, it's also in many ways more flexible um, than it has been in, in the past. A schedule that works for you. Yeah, exactly. How does your schedule work, Theo? You have a yeah. daughter. Yeah, I mean, it's insane, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I only have one, so um, yeah, it's tough. It's very tough, and it's, you know, anytime that I'm not paying attention to the business, I think, you know, somebody else is like leaping ahead. So it's like that, that, that sense of competition I think is good and helps to drive me. I think it's also important to be able to like take that time to have your weekend. Like my, my sister also runs her own business and she, when I was starting this, she was like, no, 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 because I was starting to do t too much on the weekend too. And she was like, you have got to take your weekends off or you're going to burn out. And that was, I think, one of the smartest things that, that, you know, sort of helps me to at least have that balance. It doesn't always happen. You know, I do work some weekends, but yeah, I really try to at least have that as time off, you know. And what works for you, Jane? Well, I started the company with my husband, with my partner, uh, Raymond, and so we had a vested interest in making sure that, you know, we tried to figure this out. My mother taught me that life isn't about balance, it's about resilience. And I really think, you know, you can wake up with a full schedule of meetings ahead of you and at 6.15, you know, your seven-year-old has a strep throat or a sore throat or a tummy ache and everything goes out the window and you've got to scramble <laughs> to cobble together some kind of caregiving. I think that, honestly, until we address caregiving uh, and really make it a social issue for everyone in the community, everyone in our population, and it's not just what seems to be considered a woman's issue, we're not going to resolve this. We've got to keep women in the workplace. We've also got to make sure our men have, have time with their families as well. They're also not happy with how they have to carve it up. But I do think the majority of work at home falls on women still. And we have to not allow some of our best talent to leave the workforce because they can't figure out caregiving and we don't get them back into the workforce and they're at home. And so until we figure that out and we say as a society, 
This is an economic issue and a political issue. It's not just a social issue. The McKenzie report that came out in September said that economically, at a very minimum, women in the workforce fully engaged with equal pay will kick $12 trillion into the global economy. This is an economic issue, and we have to get serious about addressing it as a, as a country and as a community, and not just as a family. Well, with that, thank you all so much for coming today to three uh, very resilient women and uh, beautiful women inside and out. I will still use the word beautiful. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your time and your thoughts, and I wish you all so much success in the future. Thank you.